Hi everyone. Today is one of the last days of our spring 2022 harvest. Maybe we'll have a bit of tea tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and then it will be the end. I can see on the weather forecast that the rain is coming for good. The rainy season will drop on Yunnan and that will be the end of the good tea making season. This harvest was hard for us. First, my father-in-law passed away about two weeks ago. So during the beginning of the harvest to the, the middle, we had to attend to him and then we had a, a week-long Buddhist celebration with the village. And while this was occurring, a streak of uh, bad weather struck our mountain, lots of rain, which uh, hindered the progress of our harvest. So it was a grim start and it was hard time for us. But fortunately, the last week has been very good for making tea. We've had sun almost uninterrupted, only a light shower at some point. And we managed eventually to make about 300 kilo of tea. I haven't weighted all the tea yet, but that should be about 300 kilo. So it is still less than last year, but still enough to supply our store for the years to come. And I haven't had that much time to drink the, the teas, especially the ones we made earlier but it seems the quality is not so bad. It might be a decent year actually. And so I would like to use the opportunity of uh, this last video probably of me behind the walk to talk about the, um, these hardships we went through and eventually how, how I overcame it. So in one of my last videos I was quite in a grim mood you could say. I was struck by the dark reality of our world and this is to be expected of course when suffering and grief is involved and I felt that I was somehow lacking of vitality and was engulfed in, uh, in sorrow and sadness for a while. But fortunately, after the passing of my father and the celebrations and a few days of rest, the vitality came again. And it got me thinking. I had a lot of time to think while watching the abyss, this dark reality. Well, if it's so dark, if the abyss is so dark, maybe it's because I don't see things, I don't write things. Imagine that your life is like a book and when you start your life, it's, it's a story, a story given by your environment, by your parents. And then can come an existential cri crisis, you could call it. Suddenly, that beautifully written no novel is totally erased and you end up with staring at blank pages. Then, one possibility is to keep looking at the blank pages and to say, you see, that's, that's what reality is and that reality is my life. Or you can pick up a pen and start writing on the blank pages. And this is what I choose to do. This hardship is actually a reminder of the philosophy I studied in the past two years. 
I started by studying Stoicism and the meditations by Marcus Aurelius is the book I like to offer the most. It's a very good entry to a few philosophical questions and is very easily applicable to life. So my entry point into philosophy was with Stoicism. And Stoicism tells you that you should focus on what you have control on. Indeed, the reality can be bleak. There is a lot of suffering, a lot of hardships. And yet, you should keep focused on what you have power over. And you should dismiss, ignore what you don't have control over. I know many people apply this kind of philosophy, but I would say that's not enough for me. So I, I continued digging in. I continued with Nietzsche, with Plato and Kant. And eventually I ended up studying Sartre and Camus and all that uh, existentialist movement, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Merleau-Ponty. And I would say these philosophers offer a complement to Stoicism. Hardships should not only be endured, but in a way they should be embraced, because that's your, that's your path in life. Now the path in life, you could say that many religious people will think that that path in life is predetermined, that you were born in a certain setting because God decided so. And some even go so far as to think that we have a determined path all along our life. So we have a purpose in life and that purpose is given to us by God. But the, ex the existentialists say otherwise. Actually, you could say that Nietzsche is the precursor of the existentialist movement. When he says that God is dead, he's not happy when he's saying that. He's saying that people had that fairly stable illusion, fairly stable path in life led by God and over the 19th century this illusion was broken down by science. So he was saying that God, it, God is dead and people killed it because of the scientific progress and the Mm, the pursuit of rationality. And I think Nietzsche doesn't offer any concrete solutions. That's why some people like to say that he's a nihilistic. But I think it wouldn't be, uh, it would be maybe reading Nietzsche too literally. And then Sartre and and Camus and Simone de Beauvoir, they, they kind of complete the, the story that Nietzsche tells. They believe that things in life have an essence. For example, you could say this tea tree was planted by us and we harvest it. And like I'm doing now, we're making tea and that tea, th there's a kind of um, theoretical conception of what tea is. And we use reality to, to kind of um, make, make it true. We, we work in order to make the fiction of tea something true in our material world. And yet Sartre argues that it is not the case for 
mankind, for humans. He believes that humans were not created with, a, with an essence, were not created with a purpose. It's up to each of us to find our own purpose in life, to write on the book, to, um, to add the fictions to the grim reality we live in. And this reality, you can, you can create, you, you live in the world that you see, you, you don't live in reality actually, you live in your mind, you live in, your, in the world that's fabricated by your consciousness. And your neighbor or your, your family members might live in a very close reality as you do. But they probably have different opinions from you, a different outlook on life. That's because their consciousness allowed them to grow their own fictions, their own beliefs, their own system of thoughts. And therefore, when you're confronted to hard, hard the harsh reality, for example, my father-in-law died you can be miserable about it if you if that's what you you choose to be of course you could say that we also have somehow a physiology that kind of pushes us to be sad when we lose a loved one but at some point i believe you can overcome this hardship by just writing a new story. I like aviation and when you fly helicopters, something I'd like to do at a point in my life, when you're in stationary flight under certain conditions, you can end up in a, in a very specific stall that's called the uh, vortex ring state when you're in stationary flight at a uh, under some specific conditions some vortices will form around the tips of your blade and they create a depression that kind of cancels the lift that's created by the blade and you start falling Okay, your helicopter um, has turbulence, shakes, and you start losing altitude. And of course, your instinct in this situation might be to increase, raise the collective, increase the, the power output of the engine in order to gain altitude again. But this doesn't work unless you have a very powerful engine which most helicopters don't have. And actually, the more, the more you power, the, um, the worse you, you make that uh, vortex ring state. The solution to stop losing altitude is to pitch down and move forward into more stable air, which is not affected by the, by the vortices. And I think that's somehow a, a good analogy to some hardships you can encounter in life. Maybe when things seem difficult, you shouldn't try to work hard against them, but instead move into calmer air. And when I mentioned last time that, for example, cooking tea was a sort of escapism uh, to the, the troubles we had at the time, well, it's true, 
But actually, you should embrace that escapism. Now, I'm, I'm even more convinced that all those distractions that allow us to go through hardships, well, they're just another way to look at life. Like someone mentioned in the comments, the pleasure of cooking some tea or having a good cup at your tea table, it's also reality. So reality is multifaceted and maybe when you're confronted to, to the harsh parts of reality, you should try to move away for some time and try to meet the better parts of reality. Now, it might not be easy. It sounds, it's not easy to, to say this once you've accomplished it. And it's because to, to get a different outlook on life, you need to have vitality. And this vitality, I still believe, is, is given by God. You, you can, it's related to the will. Sometimes you have the will to do something, sometimes you don't. But if you're constantly in a depressed state, you might miss noticing the vitality that's in you. If you take a pause, and try to um, listen to your body, maybe you will find this vitality in you. And if you let it guide you, maybe it will carry you through calmer air. And you will get away from that stall, stalling state, just like the helicopter. So overall, I think I'm quite, I feel I have grown through that experience of hardship. And I feel that it has increased maybe my resilience or I'm, I'm ready to endure more hardships in life. But waiting for the next hard time, it's also important to know when to enjoy the peaceful times. And right now you can see, I'm having a good time with this tea. This is from the natural tea gardens, from our own, own gardens that we nurture every year on the top of the mountain. This is the third harvest already, but the leaves still look good and I'm looking forward to trying them. And now at the end of this season, I really want to take the time to try all the samples, assess their quality, and I'd like to keep pushing down the rabbit hole in terms of explaining the terroir of Jingmai. Because we're based in Jingmai and we make tea here, I think that's in our power, you could say, to, um, to bring out the, the terroir. Now you see, for example, the terroir, it's a concept that some people might reject. They might think that uh, it doesn't exist. It's more of a, a, mystical, a mystical approach. Mm, maybe mm, they will focus on the varietal, the growing conditions. But I still believe that the soil is the, the strongest indicator of the quality of the tea. Now, of course, you need, you need several elements. You need that good environment, uh, that low fertilization, a uh, slight nutrient deficiency in the soil but it's also related to the, to, to the nature of the soil. So it, it's still connected to the terroir, you could say. And well, you can look at the, the, tea, the tea business, actually. The, there are many, many different ways of selling tea. And if you, actually most of the tea vendors don't really um, 
rely on the on the tier war too much. They like to give uh, fancy or funny names to their teas. And you could say that's that's also part of that existentialist approach. You could consider that T is a blank page and it's up to, to us as, as a society, as a tea community and as individual tea drinkers to make sense of what tea is. Now, one problem that I have with that approach of kind of twist the reality in the way you like is about ethics because if you can if you can change the act in the reality only according to your own benefit then it means that you don't really need to uh, care about other people or you you can only take actions that will further your interests but i think the the moral uh, that there can still be an ethic that's applicable to existentialism and actually simon de beauvoir has a book uh, about this which is called the the ethics of ambiguity uh, i've bought it but I, I haven't finished it and um well you can still apply the golden rule if you're an existentialist you you could expect other people you could treat other people as existentialists as well. And it means that you, you shouldn't feed them a story, but actually allow them to write their own story. And that's what I'm trying to do with the tea. I'm not pushing hard in terms of marketing. Um, you could say that my marketing approach is a bit boring. It's a bit plain. It's because I respect every tea drinker's path on the way of tea. And to me, what's important is that the tea drinkers or customers have the tools to understand tea better. That's why I, I don't give uh, funny names or, or do um, like make too many jokes about, about the tea. Uh, a lot of you might find this boring, but I like just to give plain information about the tea. You could say that's that's the opposite approach of a tea master. Usually the tea master tries to sell you a package. And I, I know a few of those tea masters in China. And what's interesting is they, they are not into discussing tea, actually. They have their own opinions about tea. They are passionate and convinced. They will defend their opinions and some people follow them and some people don't and i understand how this approach can be popular because then lots of people will follow you if you're confident in what you're saying but what i'm confident in actually is that we we must keep researching about tea that tea is a really passionate topic but the truth about tea, you will find it by drinking the tea. You, you will find it by, by getting accurate information about the tea and making up the story yourself. So I will stick to this marketing approach, actually, of uh, being quite boring. Because on the long run, I think that's what will give people the, um, that kind of enjoyment. I, at least that's what I like to share. That's the aspect I like to share of tea. When you're a tea master and you have a strong, you're kind of highly respected, you have a, a strong system. And it's important to have that system, actually, the tea master to be respected. They have to have an answer for every question and an answer that's logical with their other beliefs. But you could say it's a bit like a, a religion. Yeah, they, they give you a package of knowledge and you adhere to it. I am more into the dialectical approach, actually. 
indeed this tea is a this tea is a blank page and I have some opinions about the tea that sometimes I, I share um, but um, I think the the point of the path of tea is really in making up your own opinions about the tea now you could say as a tea maker I, I must infuse some of my opinions into the tea for example the shaching technique uh, I do what I think is good and so that that's an opinion and there are different ways of processing tea now this year I'm just trying uh, a slightly uh, a shaching with slightly less steaming so you might see me uh, flipping the tea a bit more than usual and I'm looking forward to seeing how it translates into the cup and actually that's about time to end this shutting session now because I feel the tea is ready it's already quite dry so thank you for watching and see you later. Bye bye.